welcome to the Imaginaries. Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of the Imaginaries, where we use our imaginations to talk about things that we imagine <laughs> with them, that we have seen or read or whatever, but definitely there is imagination involved here, mm -hmm. both on our part and the part of whoever is creating the thing. Uh -huh. that we're talking about at uh -huh. the moment. Uh, imagination is going to be so important in this episode because we are talking about space stations. Woot woot. And uh, uh, just all the space stations that exist <laughs> in science fiction. I would say and fantasy, except space station isn't really a thing that you find in a lot of fantasy. Mm. Um, so mostly just science fiction today. But we're going to take a look at some of the space stations that we particularly like uh, in books, in movies, in TV shows, and talk about what a space station is and yeah. why they're even there and what you can do on a space station that you can't do on a ship or a planet or a moon or whatever. So uh, without further ado, welcome <laughs> to this episode. Welcome. Uh, Tony, I feel like you should introduce yourself, though. I am... Ready to start, if you guys are. And so is my co-host. <laughs> and <laughs> that was the most awkward introduction ever. But yes, my name is Ken, and Tony here is facilitating the conversation today. Uh, Tony, what drew you to space stations in the first place? Why did you spearhead this particular podcast? Well, here is an excellent question to start with. What is the big freaking deal with space stations. Like, why do we even care? Um, we already have spaceships of all sorts. Mm -hmm. We can set science fiction on things that move around <laughs> so they can actually see different things. We can introduce planets. We can introduce new moons. We can colonize them. We can put air bubble domes on them. We can settle underneath them. We can have asteroids. Like, it doesn't seem as though there's necessarily a need for another setting in science fiction. And yet, space stations are something that some authors and creators return to over and over again. If you remember back in the 90s, I actually kind of vaguely remember this because I was not really watching either of them upon first release, but there was the Battle of the Space Station shows between Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5. <laughs> um, so not only did you have like multiple representations of things happening on a space station on television at one time, but they were like directly, you know, competing with each other for, for viewers. But... The question is kind of the answer. Like, space stations give you as both a reader, uh, a watcher, an author, and a creator, the ability to do things that other settings just don't. You don't have to move around on it. You still get to be in space, so it's not like you're on a planet or a moon, but it's actually, uh, you know, just kind of a free-floating, could be a town, could be a city, could be a state... Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about scale um, later, but I think it's a good time to also introduce scale into things because mm -hmm. you can have a space station that's tiny and is really well suited for, say, like isolation and possibly psychological horror. On the other hand, you could have a space station that's like the size of a solar system if you're dealing with things like ring worlds um, that come from... Larry Niven's uh, series. <laughs> Ringworld series, book, yeah. It became a series, the first of which was called Ringworld. Um, or, you know, something like a Dyson Sphere, which pops up. Uh, more recently, you have a bunch of things I'm not going to remember the names of, but different ideas of like mega structures. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the name mega structure is more common in some works of speculation, but they're all space stations to me. So um, the big deal, I think, is that you can do things with settings that you wouldn't have been allowed to otherwise. Huh. And that's cool. That is cool. That is very cool indeed. And I think, especially as we get further into the podcast and start discussing some of our favorites and some of our other burning questions about space stations... I, we're going to uncover mm -hmm. a little bit more of the, the nuances in in between the lines. In between nuances in between, I mm -hmm. just really missed 
mixed up all of my metaphors there. Apologies, as you can tell. <laughs> I'm just going to blame everything on the cold. Everything comes down to the cold. Yeah. Every single character flaw I have uh, comes down to the head cold. So. <laughs> I accept that. So, Tony, now that you've kind of explained why podcast about space stations, Mm -hmm. like, I I was asking this question earlier before the podcast, but I also just really, really want to know, like, what you think Mm -hmm. defines the difference between a space station and a spaceship. Like, are we talking scale? Well, uh, not necessarily. Again, I think you can do... It would be really compelling to have a space station that's very small, that has, you know, maybe a few rooms that can't actually move under its own power. And I think maybe that's going to be my line in the sand for what a space station is versus what uh, a spaceship or a starship is. Uh A space station is not going to be moving around on its own power. Now, Uh, you know, maybe it can move around. I I was going to say, though, like, what about in the expanse? Because, spoiler, mm-hmm. you have a space station that unexpectedly moves under its own power and has been described as mm-hmm. a space station or an asteroid, uh, like a colonized asteroid, mm-hmm. up until that point when it moves under its own power and then it becomes an entity. And I guess I'm just really curious if yeah. like that act of movement somehow transforms a thing from uh, like a rock or a thing into a entity a person Mm -hmm. a thing with sentience yeah well as per usual like we're gonna throw out a definition i'm gonna throw out a definition and then like spend the rest of the episode talking about all the exceptions (laughs) (laughs) yeah so i am totally with you like the expanse is a good uh example of that um and a really important plot centric example of that um Deep Space Nine, also in the first episode, part of what they do is move the station, move the entire station in the pilot. Um, So definitely space stations are not immovable. But I would say a general hallmark of a space station is that its movement is unusual Hmm. um, to the point that it's usually part of like an integral part of the plot if it moves or has to be moved. Like that's not just something that happens in the course of the regular adventures, the regular, you know, day-to-day proceedings in the same way that uh, it happens with a starship. And also on the other hand, not as unusual or remarkable as like an entire planet or a moon moving. Um, And I think the Expanse example is really useful to consider that as well, because I would consider uh, a base that's built from or within uh, an asteroid or, you know, a relatively small body to be a space station, uh-huh. depending. Not that not that you have to slap that label on everything that's built inside an asteroid, but, like, if it's described as a space station, um, I think that's reasonable, for sure. So as we're thinking about, you know, all of the built things that could count as space stations, uh, both those that are completely made with the intention of, you know, not moving around, hanging in space, housing some sort of population, as well as those that are built from small bodies like asteroids and have the same intentions of hanging in space, housing populations, um, and and also not moving around a whole lot. I think those both count um, as space stations. Yes. I think if you're honestly looking at like hard science, you know, big air quotes around that, but the, the hard science experience of traveling from one star system to another, you're not really going to moment mm-hmm. to moment feel that you're moving or like that's not going to be a significant component mm-hmm. of your day to day experience, the actual movement of the station. Right. So anyway, yeah. I'm curious about right. that. Like what what renders something distinctly station and something else distinctly ship? Uh, Well, I I think that you're right on in that scale does play into it. Uh, For whatever reason, generally, it seems like if you have a ship, even if you have a really large ship, stations are larger. Um, And you see this play out in Babylon 5, which is a good example. Uh, Star Trek, especially Deep Space Nine, which is a good example. You see it play out in the culture where the culture ships, 
can be really, really massive, and yet you have even more massive installations that are mostly immovable on which, you know, millions or I think maybe even billions uh, of people live, depending upon the book and the installation in question. Yeah. But it, it is definitely a scale thing, and you do find within each of those works and within other works as well, stations that are smaller than some large ships, but generally a station kind of connotes this grandeur, this scale that's very large, that you can go from the sort of like mobile town that is the spaceship uh, in those works that have large spaceships to the kind of immobile city, or like I said at the beginning, even like the size of a state where you have different communities that, you know, there's enough distance between them that they're actually separated and can form distinct communities and, like, people can move between them, uh, trade between them, potentially. Um, and that's something that is ex that you can do on uh, space stations that uh, not, doesn't necessarily happen on ships. And as soon as I say that, of course, I can think of, like, a couple of examples of books where the, the, the ships are large enough where that does happen. Um, I'm thinking immediately of Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson. Yeah. yeah. As you said, like, then that gets into, well, it's a generational ship. It's kind of like, it's moving, but it's not really moving in the same way that, like, the Enterprise is moving, getting from place to place, like, you know, point A to point B in one episode and things are happening in both those places. And like with a generational ship kind of functionally, it is a station. It is isolated. There's movement happening, but like within their reference point, the movement is kind of not meaningful. And so we can kind of think as, of, of like those slow, more hard sciencey generational ships as effectively stations. Yeah, and I think of them as going on. I think of them as stations, but with cheats in that it, yeah. it, it operates yeah. as a station for the majority of the plot. But you always know if something is re referred to as a generation ship that arrival is going to play a significant role in the plot. And this is mm -hmm. particularly yeah. a, a thing with young adult literature, where if you have a generational ship, um, a generation ship like those in Beth Revis's. Uh, a Million Suns and Across the Universe series, um, you always know that if something is a generation ship, that arrival is on the horizon somewhere, and that's going to affect plot development and character interactions mm -hmm. at some point. So I happen to think that um, the first and second installments of any YA series dealing with a generation ship usually are going to be more like station-esque, and then the third one's going to be more ship. Mm -hmm. Like, you're going to have arrival, yeah. you're going to have the transfer of goods between ship and surface, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. But th mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's like a general rule that's not remotely a hard and fast rule. Um, and it doesn't hold up as well mm -hmm. when you look at uh, hard science fiction in, uh, uh, mm -hmm. like, an adult context, I guess. Yeah. And, and I, would, I would agree with that. Um, and I, I thought, as you were talking, of another example like Kim Stanley Robinson's Aurora, uh, and that is River Solomon's... Oh, yes, um, absolutely. Uh, ...Kindest of Ghosts, which is also a generational ship, also large enough that there is social stratification, that there is, like, race and class struggle, um, that basically, you know, there's an entirely new culture uh, that has evolved on this ship air quotes, um, even though it's kind of also a station in the way, in its size, in its uh, scale, and in the way that the people who are living there uh, kind of treat it as a thing that, you know, like, is continually moving, but there's so many of them and it's taken so long that, like, what is the, what is the point of the movement? Uh, there really isn't a point. So I, I think that that's a really good thing to point out. Maybe the difference in talking about, you know, books that have ships that they treat as uh, ships versus books that are set on stations or treat their ships as stations is really the importance of movement, the importance of getting from one place to another on the plot. And I said books, but I, I mean <laughs> shows and movies as well. Yeah, we definitely advocate not trusting anything that a book or a movie or a TV show says about the vehicle or containment vessel in which people live. 
uh, because things mm -hmm. may operate one way and be called another thing, and that's true of any genre or any kind of science fiction. Something might be called a thing, but it might actually functionally operate differently. So, yeah. Um, yes. Are we talking about yeah. things that operate like space stations or things that are called space stations or bull? Yeah, right. What is the station now? Right, and that's... Thing? <laughs> yes. And speaking of that, we actually have a precedent. Oh. For a whole lot of science fiction, there isn't really a precedent. Like, you can think about uh, ships visiting other planets in our own solar system, and we haven't done that. And by that I mean ships that, you know, carry people with them, not unmanned probes. Um, right. Oh, I totally not, did not mean to say manned or unmanned. Damn it, and I said it anyway. <laughs> peopled um, and unpeopled. That carry folk peopled and, and unpeopled. <laughs> unfolded. Yeah, <laughs> folk <laughs> Foking ships. <laughs> the folking um, it sounds like a really bad swear word. But to say nothing of, like, ships leaving the solar system, generational ships taking, you know, multiple generations to get to another star, faster than light travel, um, putting colonies on other moons, on other planets, like, these are all science fictional ideas. But the space station is not. Even though we don't have Babylon 5 or Deep Space Nine, obviously, we have a space station, and we have for, for many, many years. Like, there are, there are adults on Earth who have never lived, like, like during their life, there has never not been a space station. Oh, how hard is that? And that's kind of weird wow. to think about. It's cool. It's also kind of, mm, this is a timely podcast then, because our existing space station is under threat. We just had the prototype Chinese space station uh, break apart upon re-entry, uh, planned mm -hmm. sort of re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So... You know, space stations are on people's mind because the U.S. Uh, slash U.S. ESA, Russian collaboration space station, is currently being defunded on the U.S. end of things. Um, so we might actually see, in the next five or ten years, the end of the International Space Station. Now, this is not necessarily... Not necessarily... Well, no. In my opinion, it's a bad thing. But... Mm -hmm. uh, the space station has outlived its original um, intended lifespan and it has taken mm -hmm. on new lives and developed new trajectories, which is awesome. Not physical new tra trajectories, but you know, you know what I mean? Anyway, <laughs> so like the space station yes. has come to mean something that it was never intended to mean in the first place. It's come to become, it's come to right. come to become, oh my God, it has come to symbolize a, bridge between a variety of cultures in many ways it is the operational parallel to the what you might see in deep space nine like a bridge between cultures alien cultures mm -hmm. in deep space nine but yeah earth cultures in uh yeah. in our world and with our international space station which i mean i've read some analyses of what might happen if say we lose communication with the space station and there are, uh, you know, uh, there's a joint party aboard and like, what would that interaction be like? You are emissaries of your cultures, you know, however many, um, miles up and, and you like, you don't have communication with your earthbound superiors anymore. What does that cultural interaction look like when it's in, mm -hmm. in essence freed from earth? And I'm real. Yeah, let's shut me up and move on. Well, and I think it's cool that basically this, the space station that we have had in orbit can help contribute to the science behind the science fiction because we understand so much more about what long term life in space right now looks like. Right. And because the, of what's happened to the. Well, I was just going to add yeah, like the, the twin study between Mark and Scott Kelly. Um, which concluded uh -huh. ooh, um, a full year ago. I'm forgetting exactly when they brought him down. Uh, but separating two identical twins and then exposing one to a year of low Earth orbit space flight, I guess, um, not true space flight, but low yeah. Earth orbit flight, um, has given us so many breakthroughs in, in the science. At, at our library, we recently hosted a neuroscientist who's studying as her graduate research with a NASA grant, 
Um, she's studying the effects of uh, space radiation, low Earth orbit radiation, on human memory mm. and using the Kelly mm. brothers as anecdotal support for the actual research that she is doing with mice. It's so interesting huh. what we know now compared to uh, what we knew even 10 years ago just from having this continuous presence on the space station. The science is incredible. Mm -hmm. And as much as we nerd out over yeah. science fiction on this podcast, uh, Stranger Than Fiction happens to be one of my favorite movies for a reason, and also because it's, it's true that real life, real science is often stranger and just as interesting, if not more interesting, than the science fiction we come up with. So I highly recommend looking into the twin study if you aren't already familiar and speculating as to like what would it actually take to safely send people to and from Mars. This is perhaps one of the greatest, greatest barriers we have to uh, establishing something along the lines of the Martian. I mean, no matter what Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and these other um jerks do with their luxury vehicles <laughs> uh you know we don't actually have a safe way to send astronauts to and from mars without them uh wasting away to dangerous levels without them being mm -hmm. incredibly negatively affected by uh hard radiation in space um and that would affect their muscle mass that would affect their uh, you know, their chances of cancer, both then and then upon return to Earth, it would also affect their memory, like significantly. And if you don't have mm -hmm. good memory when you're flying a spacecraft, I mean, that d doesn't seem like a good mix, does it? Uh, you kind of need to remember things in space if you're, mm -hmm. you've got a couple billion dollars riding on your effort. So yeah, like it, there's been a lot of progress, but now we know a lot more about what we don't know. And I think mm -hmm. that's a pretty exciting place to be, actually. And I'm hoping it's a barrier to uh, yeah. Elon Musk, personally. Right. But whatever. Right. Um, and, and I mean, I think you're, you're right on to call the ISS as kind of, a, as a, you know, a, a modern-day prelude to what Deep Space Nine can be in the future, obviously, in a really different way. But I think, you know, you don't have to take what's going on on the ISS uh, and only compare it to far future science fiction. Like there are really compelling works that deal with either the ISS or an ISS analog uh, in science fiction right now. I think one of uh, the most recent ones that I've read is After the Flare by Deji Bryce Alokutan, uh. um, which looks specifically at, uh, I actually can't remember now, it's, it's kind of like an alternate it's the current present. It's um, the Nigerians in space. It's the series, it's the sequel right? to Nigerians in space. Yeah, um, and uh, basically, uh, after uh, the flare happens, a large solar flare, something starts to go wrong with this space station that is like the ISS. And the book is kind of following, you know, what happens to the the astronauts who are up there, the one astronaut who gets left behind. That's not necessarily the central thrust of the book because there's a lot of other things going on but it is an integral part of it and it's definitely you know it's science fiction that's set right now on the science fictional again air quotes setting that is the space station which is not babylon 5 but still a really uh compelling setting for a work of science fiction yeah yeah, I, I'm super interested to read that series because I've had it on my to-read list for a while and it's not available in my little corner of Montana. So I'm getting around to it eventually, but it's one of those things that I have to hunt down a little more creatively than I usually do. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what other big questions do yeah. you have about uh, space stations that we haven't answered? Well, we have, I mean, kind of the the examples that I think of immediately when I think of space stations are Babylon 5 mm -hmm. and Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. And in both of those cases, um, and, you know, if you kind of extend beyond those to think of ring worlds, to think of uh, culture installations, to think of megastructures, like, what they tend to have in common, as I'm listing them off, is that lots of people live there, lots of people... Uh, human and non-human uh, pass through them, cultures interact, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's also 
uh, this tradition in science fiction of the space station as blank in space. <laughs> um, so some space stations are like prisons in space. Some space stations are like hospitals in space. Some <laughs> space stations are like luxury condos in space. Like, you know, you have something, sure. basically you're taking this untethered little bit of earth, not really changing it very much, um, except, you know, kind of pun- punting it into the future. Um, so that a story can be both isolated and isolating for the characters. So either you have this place that characters are trying to reach in the example of like, you know, a work that's dealing with a really big class divide where you have like the rich people living on the station and everyone else like on the planet. Um, and I can think of a couple of examples of that. There was this yeah. movie there with Matt Damon and Jodie Foster. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, um, Elise- it like, wasn't very good. Yeah, that was it. That was it. But that was a really good example of this. And then the prison in space, like, uh, there was an episode of Voyager um, where the the gag of the episode was actually that they were in space and not on a planet. Um, But you have, God, the old Nick show Space Cases did that. Basically, you have, in the same way that prisons are meant to be isolated anyway, space stations kind of take that a step further. And... You know, you kind of, you can remove this setting, whether it's a luxury condo uh, or a prison, and then the characters have to deal with either getting to or from, and also within that station, being isolated actually there. So again, it's a good way to um, do this kind of, you know, psychological terror, if not necessarily horror, like, you know, maybe the subgenre is No, it's kind of like a locked room mystery in a sense. Like, you've got got a challenge to escape from the locked sphere. And I think a great example of that actually is in uh, Alistair Reynolds' The Prefect, which came out about a decade ago, and its sequel, Elysium Fire, just came out um, recently. But in that first book, The Prefect, you have several mm, parallel storylines going on at once, and one of those is dedicated to a young prefect who is trapped on a space station that has been overrun by... uh, mm, Milita- militantized militized um, robots and so the challenge there is for her to not just survive but also to get a message out and then to uh, safely get her and her companions out of the space station in order to um, mm-hmm. then eventually like resolve the the, con- the greater conflict that's happening throughout the, the glitter band which is a collection of space stations in this particular series And that actually kind of Mm -hmm. reminds me that we've talked about space stations as isolate, but in the Glitter Band, in Alistair Reynolds, the Prefect, and Elysium Fire, you have a great sort Mm -hmm. of counterpoint to that or expansion of that idea where you have a lot of different Mm -hmm. isolated space stations. They're not really isolated in that they have data streams that connect them at all times. They do trade with each other. They're taking part in a system of governance they call a demarchy. So it's a democratic anarchy. So they're each kind of Mm -hmm. their own social experiment. Some of them are luxury condos. One of them is a hospice planet. Um, Not planet, hospice station. One is presumably a prison station. One is the prefect station. And that's where all the prefects live and are based. And then you have um, Mm -hmm. a couple that are like refuges where artists and um, political outcasts will be drawn to and things like that. And I think um, perhaps more clearly than many other uh, works, whether they're books or television shows, the, uh, the, the books of Alistair Reynolds really manage to dig into this whole notion of how do you uh, govern a space station? How does a space station exist in relation to other bodies? Because there's a planet involved as well. You know, like, how do things relate to each other when you've got space stations involved? And and that's that's mm-hmm. pretty interesting because usually we have one space station that we're dealing with in a work. And that's usually enough. Like, I mean, heck, Alien was like one ship. You don't need really mm-hmm. a lot in terms of scale in order to 
have a great fully fleshed science fictional work, but I like seeing mm -hmm. uh, literary experiments all along that scale spectrum, like from very little to mm -hmm. very, very large. And the mega structures of Ringworld, mm -hmm. I'm the least familiar with, but I'd love to hear more about how they work and um, are they different from other space stations, that kind of a thing. And I think we were talking about this before we started recording, but both of us have read Ringworld, um, but it's been a long, long time since since Centuries. we have. Um, and honestly, my go-to for, like, mega structures in science fiction is the Culture series. Mm -hmm. And what that does with them really is to establish this way to get uh, a planetary population, um, but to massage it in a way that isn't necessarily bound by uh, the constraints of a planet or a moon, like what we know could exist. Basically, if you have these uh, structures that can be created by minds within the culture series, and by minds, there's like a capital M there. Mm -hmm. The minds are uh, intelligences, They're artificial extra intelligences. Uh, uh huh. They are. They're very. They're very mindy. They're the mindest, actually. Um, but they uh, can basically create anything. So you can, within these giant structures, have totally new environments. Um, you can have totally different environments within one structure. You can ha house many, many different uh, species. Uh, and by that I mean not only intelligent species, but also like entire ecosystems that support those intelligent species within one structure. Uh -huh. So that's kind of pushing things in, you know, the absolute grandest direction. <laughs> um, how big can we get, basically, is the very question big. that culture asks with its structures, right? And the answer is, is very, very big indeed. And then there are works that go even larger, but then you have to kind of like argue about what is like, what are, what are the upper bounds of what something, what a structure can look like? Like, is it something that can encompass multiple star systems? Is it something that could right. encompass like entire portions of the galaxy, entire galaxies? Like that is, these are all right. Or, or taking yeah. a diagonal, like, is it a station or is it a planet? That question mark exists yeah. in a lot of the really right. super large scale works. And it also exists in some of the right. super weird works like Cameron Hurley's The Stars mm -hmm. Are Legion, which is a favorite of both of ours. Ah, uh, yes. I, in which we have yes. things that are kind of alive and are also kind of planets and are also kind of stations in that there are levels, mm -hmm. like there are discrete levels, which seems very stationy. Um, but then there's also like... It's alive, so it's not a... Mm -hmm. Or is it? And then it's a planet, sort of, but is it? And so mm -hmm. that blurring in certain books, and I'm assuming if it's ever made into a TV show, <laughs> in a TV show, uh, is occasionally very, very pleasurable indeed, that, that blurring. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's frustrating, I think, if the blurring is unintentional or is because... Uh, authors or creators are um, going for s like grandness over comprehensiveness, I guess, or com comprehensibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's difficult and it's useful to talk about the difficulty of rendering something that's truly massive, like a ring world, understandable and enjoyable and pleasurable to inhabit. You know, in, in that it's distinctly stationy like it's stationy it's not just a setting it is distinctly a space station as a player in this work um but also yeah. that that station is accessible to the reader in a way um some of the more interesting stations are in a sense interactive like cameron hurley's mm -hmm possible stations are in her book. Um, some of them actually have AIs and are interactive in that sense. Like they engage you as entities. Um, and some are just mm -hmm. like gush darn interesting settings. Like I'm thinking here of Fonda Lee's Zero Boxer, which is a YA book that I read 
last year in which the station is not sentient. It's not particularly, it's not like specifically interesting in and of itself, but it creates a really interesting space for events to unfold in. And those events are zero gravity boxing uh, matches and athletic mm -hmm. events. And just the way that the station is integrated is in and of itself distinctive and unusual and engaging. But if it were super large and it became difficult to determine that this is a different setting from any other weird sci-fi setting, I don't know like how I would feel about that. And I'm just rambling here a little bit, but I'm wondering, Tony, if you've read any books where maybe the stations didn't work for you. Um, no. <laughs> Sorry. The first, <laughs> I, 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 nope. I hate to answer questions with like, no, but, nope. but I honestly can't think of any books where I'm like, oh, no, that station, that station, that space station didn't <laughs> really work. But I actually want to, I do want to continue your thought on the Stars are Legion, uh, Cameron Hurley's book, if you don't mind me picking mm, up that ball and running with it. Yep, yep. Because that was really the example I was thinking about many, many minutes ago now when I said we're going to establish some of these uh, definitions of what space stations are uh, and then tear them down. And I think that Cameron Hurley does that in a really interesting way, um, in a way that is not going to be fun for everyone, in a way that for me, even though I said no to your question and now I'm you know, saying that this is something that I like... Uh, didn't worked and didn't work at, at the same time. Like I was, I really wanted to know, like, what were they on? Are these living ships? Are they stations? Are they like modified bodies in space? Like what, what's going on here? Um, and that was so cool. Like to, you know, play fast and loose with that. Like, even though we made the, uh, assertion earlier that generational ships, uh, ships that are very large, ships that might as well not be moving because their journeys are taking so long, might as well be stations. Um, they're still ships. Like, the, the author calls them a ship, the characters call them ships, um, and we can make arguments, certainly for, for them being more station-like, according to our definition of stations. But what I really like about what Cameron Hurley does is that she shows you in this book, like, what it means to both be a station and not be a station at the same time. And what I dislike about this book is that we get to see what it means not to be a station and to be a station at the same time. So I'd be interested <laughs> in seeing more of that for sure. Uh, in the same way that, like, I would like to see more examples of what Alistair Reynolds does with the Glitter Band, most recently in Elysium Fire, because there aren't a lot of other books where you have small, mostly immobile, self-contained stations uh, that are joined together in that sort of amalgamation. Um, so basically, I guess my, my request here is for more unusual stations, more stations that we don't really tend to see in science fiction, both on screen and off. Uh -huh. Um, and maybe, you know, my saying no to have I encountered a station that I really don't like is really just a lack of, an overall lack of familiarity with the stations that do exist in part because I don't think there are that many that are necessarily treated as integrally as in Babylon 5, as in Deep Space Nine, as in Ringworld, um, as in Elysium Fire and the Stars are Legion. But let me pivot. Uh -huh. Here is my pivot. Okay. I want to, in the few minutes that we have left, shift from thinking about space stations mostly as a setting mm -hmm. and think about them as a, a canvas on which the characters are painted. Ew. So who lives on space stations is really the question I'm trying to get at. Like, are there certain ways that authors and creators tend to treat characters who spend time or spend their lives on space stations as opposed to those characters who are on planets or moons or ships? Sure. Um, yeah, so what I do think, you think? Yeah, no, I love that idea because the first thing that leaps to mind is military industrial hierarchies. Uh, so the first thing that comes to mind when I hear space station for better or worse, mostly for better is Anne Leckie's, uh, ancillary mercy, which is the third book in her, uh, series, the ancillary series. And in that specific, uh, station, you have a military person who, well, person, yeah, military 
entity who mm-hmm. moves in and occupies a station that's been mismanaged and which has been allowed to sort of divide itself into uh, a social hierarchy, a self-sustaining social hierarchy, which is independent of the military hierarchy. And so then you have this really interesting intersection and conversation between the military hierarchy, which is coming in to reestablish order, and the social hierarchy, which is basically a kind of classism, and how, like, one hierarchy tries to subvert the other, and then the other one tries to survive or subvert the other one. And, and that's, that's just one example among many. There are many space stations, I think, where there are military or pseudo-governmental structures um, taking place. In, mm-hmm. And I think of um, uh, Deep Space Nine as a, as a great example where maybe it's not a military and that the Federation is not a military organization. Uh, it isn't, right? I'm not hallucinating that. It's... No, but it's like, it's pseudo-military. It, it, like, it's definitely based on It US has Navy. trappings. It has trappings of the military. And I guess that's kind of yeah, what I'm leaning towards. In for that. sure. And a lot of space stations end up occupying this nebulous space where maybe they don't play host to a specifically military sort of hierarchy, but it is a pseudo-military hierarchy or a governmental structure that is pretty rigidly top-down mm-hmm. controlled. And then you actually see that sort of separated out into physical layers or sections of the space station. Uh, And you see this also in ships on a smaller scale, but on a space station, it allows for, given the scale, usually, it allows for very concrete and definitive demarcations between the different uh, elements of the hierarchy. And I don't know if I've, like, read a lot of books or seen a lot of movies that don't have that kind of a structure. They exist, but even in Cameron Hurley's The Stars Are Legion, like you still see levels and cultures that are contained in their levels and don't interact with other levels. Or if they Mm -hmm. do, they have very specific ideas about the people who occupy those levels, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Level-based. Yeah. Bigotry. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting way to do visually if you're on screen or uh, concretely, I guess. I'm not sure what my, <laughs> my adverb should be. But basically to take, <laughs> you know, implicit social stratification and to out and out illustrate it, whether that is, you know, a commentary on that stratification in the way that it is uh, in the Stars or Legion in the way that it is in a work like uh, River Solomon's An Unkindness of Ghosts, even though that's a ship, but it's treated like a station. <laughs> um, and, you know, you, even in Babylon 5, where it's the commentary isn't necessarily happening explicitly, like you see uh, on screen where certain levels are occupied by... Um, people who are down on their luck, who are very poor, who came looking for a better life and couldn't make it, and so they kind of, like, subsist down there, and that's part of, like, the station culture. Um, You know, whether the analog there is a city or a state or a nation state, um, it is something that's large enough to have these different stratified populations, and that's something that's relatively unique to a space station, Um, even though it's kind of painting the same picture that a a ground-based work might paint in terms of uh, what the city looks like. But it can also turn the whole notion of a city on its head by putting it in space. And that's something that I think some of the best science fiction that has uh, space stations does. Yeah, and it'll be really interesting, I think, to contrast some of these examples we've looked at today with the um, examples we end up examining in the third uh, sort of third podcast in this series, which is going to be looking at uh, cities, I guess, planetary based cities or cities. Um, The third kind of enclosed space in this series will be, um, you know, something that's more traditionally resembles a city. And um, I think in, in many ways, you know, we hear about space stations being cities in space, whether or not there are cities that are prison cities or whatever else they might be. Mm -hmm. They are usually like, that's a term that's thrown around a lot. The station is a city in space and Mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to draw very explicit parallels and contrasts to cities 
that are yeah. described and built elsewhere. And I also think it's interesting to note that stratification, the parallel of the social and the physical, allows for a journey of self-recognition and self-understanding as yes. characters ascend from a deep level to an upper level or an upper level yeah. to a deep level. It kind mm -hmm. of reminds me of Journey to the Center of the Earth, but without animals yeah. and their social cultures instead. And two great examples of uh, this kind of journey are Cameron Hurley's um, Stars Are Legion and also um, Senlin Ascends by Josiah... Uh -huh. I forget Bancroft. His, Bancroft, yeah. And, and that is somewhere between a space station and a city and a tower. And it's got like elements of all of those. And, and we'll talk about them more when we get to the, the city podcast. But this mm -hmm. idea that you can quickly or in a way that plot wise hangs together a uh, journey from one level to the next, to the next, to the next, that allows for these very peculiar and specific um, hero's journeys, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, like the archetype gets flipped a little bit and reworked a little bit, but it's there. And it's very common in space station narratives that you have someone who journeys from level to level. And yeah. I find that really an interesting feature as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. And I think that is an excellent point to end on for our personal podcast journey this <laughs> evening. My hero's journey. Your hero's <laughs> journey. podcast. Through this podcast, you were a real hero. Thank you. I am yes. not. <laughs> and, well, our listeners were real heroes to come along with us on this Very true. space station journey. Yes. So, um, would you be so kind as to tell the folks where they can find us? You know, if you Google me, in theory, you can... <laughs> <laughs> but... That said, you can find our website at www.imaginaries.net where we are posting uh, not just our podcast, but also now original content. We've got some excellent little book reviews, if I do say so myself, up. Uh, <laughs> and some of them are from me. At least one of them is from Tony. And Tony is also working mm -hmm. on some original video content. He's working on the technicalities now. So you'll have more to look forward to in the future. You can find yeah. us on our Twitter account, which is imaginary underscore pod. We do respond to tweets. So please, you know, pop on there. And if we missed a you know, really important space station or space station related point, please don't hesitate to call us out. We love hearing from you guys. Uh, you can also, of course, listen to our podcasts wherever you listen to your podcasts, whether that is iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube. And uh, we would love for you, if you do listen to our podcast on one of those sites, that you would drop us a review. That really helps us be found uh, by others and also for us to feel good about ourselves. So, <laughs> you know, both of those are really important, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if I do say so myself. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Tony, we've mentioned that there's going to be a third, uh, you know, addition to this series, but we've got another podcast coming between now and then. And what is that podcast? Oh, God. Hang on. Let me look. <laughs> so our next podcast is going to be about camp Ooh. in science fiction yeah. and to a lesser extent in fantasy, but camp in science fiction in particular. And not then camping. Have, and also no, not glamping, but camp. No. Yes. And then we have the city ah. in science fiction and fantasy. Uh -huh. Yes, excellent. So you've got a lot to look forward to. Thank you, Tony, for being willing to look up that list. So are there any uh, shout-outs you want to give to anyone this week? Yes, this week we do have some shout-outs. In fact, some of them are <laughs> super posh in that we did get uh, some shout-outs from Rebellion Publishing, which is responsible for uh, David, Thomas's more, David Thomas Moore's Not So Stories, which we reviewed on our website. Uh, Davis Tom David Thomas Moore himself, gave us a little thank you for uh, reviewing his collection and uh, we wanted to thank him for thanking us because uh, we loved the collection and it was a very, very interesting compliment to several other collections that we reviewed simultaneously. So uh, those are our shout outs for this week. Uh, check out Rebellion Publishing at David Thomas Moore on Twitter and uh, check us out too, of course. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Until next time. Until next time. Stay imaginary. Stay campy.